This time, we're taking a look at the French steampunk film, The City of Lost Children. And along the way, we ask, why didn't this get a U.S. release? Did anyone know Ron Perlman could speak French? And who designs a murder robot? When you're born in the gutter, you end up in the podcast. This is Force Fed Sci-Fi. Hello, folks. Welcome, welcome, welcome back to a wonderful episode of Force Fed Sci-Fi. My name is Sean Michael Culp, and along with me is my friend and co-host. I am Chris Rupp, and we are kicking off Sean's picks of foreign sci-fi films. That's right. With The City of Lost Children. Woo! And joining us for this episode is a... Good friend of Sean's and a special guest, Mr. Matt Hoopert. Hey, guys. Thank you for having me. Uh, very excited to discuss circus, steampunk, future, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're happy to have you, Matt. One of just my favorite genre. <laughs> steampunk, circus, whatever. whatever. <laughs> very niche. It sounds like there's only three or four films in yeah, that genre. It's like a four-movie genre. <laughs> <laughs> I think you might be waiting for the criteria and re-releases for those. <laughs> <laughs> yes 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 and this film uh I'm, i guess i've been kind of interested in seeing it i think since we started the podcast i put it on the list way back when and then when we found out i was like all right i'll pick this month now i finally get to watch this movie um so i'm really excited because i find ron perlman to be uniquely looking and interesting yes <laughs> so yeah why not why not give us a synopsis chris break this down <laughs> okay so after realizing his young companion has been abducted a local strongman enlists the help of a young thief to find out what happened wow not bad does Kinda. not sound like a science fiction film <laughs> <laughs> with that description it really doesn't no say, <laughs> this sounds like a revenge film or something like a take it like a noir of like from back in the day or something like there's a real simple like i don't know yeah it doesn't sound sci-fi at first it's this like is, an off-brand version of john ford's the searchers yeah. with john wayne <laughs> but french right oh, french. Oh, oh, oh. very french yes <laughs> oh yeah by the way this is a french film so we're adding it to the in the catalog we did alphaville i have oh. you seen alphaville i haven't right? seen alphaville you have no oh well i recommend it okay chris what do you think decent film <laughs> okay. very confusing very confusing cool but matt if you want to just watch a interesting detective movie that's all French. Give it a shot. Uh, that sounds great. <laughs> <laughs> Four stars. So, <laughs> so I'm excited to break this down. Uh, the director of this movie, I believe there's two of them. It's Marc Caro and Jean-Pierre Yonet. <laughs> that's my uh, attempt at a french accent we're going to apologize in advance for any sort of uh <laughs> mispronunciations or um you know french if, if we piss off any french people like we're sorry sort i feel of. like we we've definitely punched down on the french sometimes <laughs> with our accents and baguettes well we they should stop making it so easy <laughs> Bird, <laughs> that is oh true. Gosh. Actually, Matt, we. Used I was to... unaware this was such an anti-French. <laughs> we... I don't know if I would have come. No, <laughs> we used to actually have a smoking French cow that we kind of created on this podcast. Used to have. <laughs> I'm still here, Sean. I never left. Boo. <laughs> I hear you are disparaging my home country of France. <laughs> they should have this. He could have been in this movie for sure. A smoking French cow? Every film me? is better with an angry French smoking cow. <laughs> if that, if like Ron Perlman was just riding like an angry smoking French cow, that seems it doesn't seem that far off for this movie. <laughs> it seems possible. Best movie ever made would be that. <laughs> <laughs> if it was like a western, but it's just Ron Perlman riding a smoking French cow, that would be two searchers. That's two like, searchers. I feel like yeah. Jean Pierre was like, all right, we could have the angry smoking French cow, but yeah. this would just. That's be just a weird taste. Of, uh, uh, take on blazing saddles where instead of Alex Carrick <laughs> riding a bull, it's Ron Perlman riding a cow. <laughs> With Minette hanging on. Y'all didn't think you'd get a blazing saddles reference in this episode, did you? No. <laughs> well, like we've alluded, Ron Perlman is the star as one. And uh, he does not speak. Well, he speaks French in this, but he didn't know a lick of French. Right. I could be wrong, right? But I do think 
I think it says on Wikipedia that he learned it phonetically. They literally were like, here's how you pronounce your words. This is what it means. And that's that, you know? And he was just like, all right. Uh, which is cool. <laughs> like, <laughs> Give it a shot. I think I'd rather the director was like, I wanted, I thought that would work for the character too, given the character is like childlike and given he's sort of not, um, you know, not fully adult. So it's like he figured that kind of translates via Ron Perlman not knowing this language, which is I, interesting. I agree. Cause he's basically just like a sailor. He yeah. was a sailor and then he's like the strong man in the circus, which I feel like Ron Perlman, I saw a movie. What did I see? I saw him in a movie last year where he was a strong man again. Yeah. And so I'm like, I wonder if it's like. He's getting he, type, got typecast a lot. As, <laughs> hey, you look like a circus strong man. That's perfect because this movie needs a circus strong man. <laughs> Maybe it's the chin. I don't Gotta know. Gotta be the chin. I think this is now like a third film where we talked about Ron Perlman in some way, shape, or form. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's right. We've got Pacific Rim. We had Alien Resurrection, another uh, Jean Pierre Jeunet film. Oh my god! I forgot and now we have the city of lost children. Wow, we are, we have somehow talked about Ron Perlman many times. Very lucky to <laughs> discuss him so many because, like, I don't know if we wanted to. Have, we might have or, an order of business we have to get to first, but I'm gonna. I, I have. I want to talk about Ron Perlman in terms of how he looks. You know, I think it's a good. Sec- I mean, in the past two films we've, with Ron Perlman that we've discussed, he's always been a supporting character. This is the first film we've talked about where he is the lead character. Yeah. He is the lead guy. He's the man. And it's fun to kind of track his career post this movie because his biggest claim to fame before this was the Beauty and the Beast television show opposite Linda Hamilton. And like there are, there's pictures that circulate on the internet in his and he's in full get up for the entirety of the show. Wow. And it, it's insane. Like, I think the show only ran for, like, three years. Uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> it's probably so expensive with all the makeup and yeah, stuff. Yeah, oh, my gosh. But, oh, wow. Yeah. But if you look at him after City of Lost Children, he does Alien Resurrection with um, JPP. And then kind of, like, language languishes for a bit. And then he does Hellboy mm-hmm. in 2004. Again, in full makeup get up. You don't see Ron Perlman outside of that. But then he does Sons of Anarchy. And that's... Like that was arguably the biggest show on television for like four or five years, and then mm-hmm. it just completely went off the rails. But I'm amazed at just how much work he does, given by just how like I think troll is the wrong word, but like go- <laughs> <laughs> like golemesh that he looks like. I think he looks. I was saying this before. I think Ron Perlman is one of those actors where like you put his face in the movie, and that's like half your special effects budget. <laughs> it's just like he looks so unique that he, like you know, like yes, with Hellboy they put so much makeup on him, but it's like it feels like they had to put less makeup on him than a different act, just because it's like he looks so interesting, mm-hmm. and I do think for someone like this director who's kind of trying to do like a fairy tale type thing or del toro a man obsessed with like monsters and creepy crawlies and all these things like i assume he saw that i think this this is before he me like works with del toro i think right yeah. i think like i totally can picture del toro watching this and just being like who is this guy i have to have him in a movie like <laughs> just the way he looks he is looks- so interesting he looks the part he can play, yeah. and I think that's why he gets so many circus roles. Yeah, because they just look at him and they're like, you know, you'd be perfect. But I oh I oh, and I want I want to make sure like saying up front like I think he's this is an amazing performance like and it's such an interesting like it almost feels like when actors talk about being able to do a role that's like almost brings them back to like acting school doing like black box theater type exercises because it's like very li- limited words and stuff but like he always has interesting emotions on his face Mm -hmm. he's always like uh affecting in a way that's like really interesting to look at despite there being limited words that the character uses so i watched it just like mesmerized by like him and the decisions he's making and stuff i totally back you with that it's like almost a silent he has to really lean into like what they had to do in the silent film era right it was all physical and it works as his character right because it's like childlike and it becomes almost like mime like or like old school clowning like where he has to do so much with his face and so much with his physicality i guess in general uh it's very interesting i i totally agree 
um, Ron Perlman, like we've said, you know, some of his movies he's been in, but I feel like in a way he's always typecast as the strong man, yeah. the villain. And so you really don't get to see him in a role like this yeah. ever. And I kind of like that because yeah. I get to see his range more and be like, right. oh, wow. This guy's got some chops. Yeah, know? for he sure. has that such deep timber to his voice, and he's a very prolific voice actor. Like I'm looking at his credentials yeah. right now, and it's a lot of, like, um, like he was Clayface on the new Batman Adventures. Checks out. Yeah. <laughs> Checks also out. was in a, did the same role for Batman, the animated series. <laughs> And they didn't. That was the only non, the only part of the show they didn't draw, right? Like they just put him in the, you know, a shot at. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> they just like transported, like it's just shots of him. Well, he continued doing uh, villain work for like all like Batman animated shows. Um, looks like he was also a villain in Kim Possible at one point. Cool. Yeah, um, cool, cool. <laughs> if you watch a lot of Spike TV in the in the late 2000s, that he was the narrator on A Thousand Ways to Die. Oh, I just <laughs> no was thinking way. about that show and just like watching into my college dorm like this just gnarly That's a that, that's that's a whole other podcast talking about like the morality of that show. We don't have to talk about it. Sorry, go ahead. This also isn't a Ron Perlman podcast, although no. it easily could be. I mean, he does prolific voice work, video game work, so he's just very he has an instantly recognizable voice. Yeah. Like if Morgan Freeman did voiceover more voiceover work and more video game work, like right. Ron Perlman is probably like the Morgan Freeman for white people. <laughs> <laughs> well it's always so rewarding, like you were saying, Sean, when you see someone like this who does often play like he doesn't just play the heavy. He usually plays like I feel like a nuanced version of the heavy, or like he can do like Hellboy is an interesting, really interesting character. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's so cool to see him like really spread out and in an early role in his career and like show just from the start. Like this dude looks this way, but he has so much range. Mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, it's really interesting. Absolutely, and I think uh, speaking of like range and kind of being a lot more of the adult in the film the girl that plays mignette the the young french actress who's got to be like eight or nine in this film judith <laughs> sure <laughs> sure this was like her only role right did she not act again she I played don't... another she played another she had another couple of roles but i think she was only in four films but wow. yeah she's i mean it's what happens usually yeah. with child actors yeah. right. they grow up they hit puberty and people don't want to cast them in anything anymore because they're not cute anymore yeah <laughs> but I thought she did pretty well. That was like great. Mignette and um, kind of leading one to like the end to get his brother, I guess. Yeah. Uh, Den Ray, I think, was his, his brother, right? Don Ri. Don Ri, yes. I thought that kid was cool too, but I also, that's another thing where I'm like, maybe it's just such an interesting thing to watch that kid just like eat a bunch of food. <laughs> like, I don't know how good the performance is versus I like, I could just watch that kid eat like an entire table full of bread. Yeah. And like that's pretty good. That's pretty watchable. Yeah, it was his whole role. The his whole was role, just really. Eating things the whole time. <laughs> like eating. And also the burp. Don't forget burping. Yeah, the, burp, <laughs> the burp was a big part of it too. <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> but uh, hey, I enjoyed watching him. Me too. Yeah. He, he they cast him right. Yeah. So it, they look similar. <laughs> the casting on the sheet said like we need a kid who eats and it's going to be interesting. Like we need an interesting eating child. <laughs> can he burp on? Commands? Can he burp on command? <laughs> <laughs> and they found him. It's a weird casting call to have. <laughs> and Crank. Now, Crank, was that the doctor? That was the robot. That was the robot. Daniel Emil Fork? Yeah, the murder robot. The murder robot. This movie, everyone looks interesting. Let's get that. I want to get that off the bat. Every single person is an interesting looking person <laughs> in this movie. By the I mean and I mean the actors themselves. Like every actor in this is like an interesting face. Uh as like an interesting physicality. And mm-hmm. I feel like that's like half the work of this movie was just <clears throat> them being like, let's just cast really interesting looking people. Yeah, because the doctor guy, he's like bald, but he's got like a huge nose and his face is like really skinny right. and he's lanky. Right. His like teeth are all jagged up. Right. I mean he but he did a great job, great performance. Yeah. Dominique Pignon <laughs> looks the way he does. <laughs> <laughs> the diver. Yeah. <laughs> You're right. They just That performance is really, like, you know, not to like go over the whole cat that performance was really interesting to me too. Like he has to play all these clones and he also has to play like himself, like as the original. I thought that that was a great performance as well. He did great. 
great. I mean, I so that part of the film where he's kind of revealed as like the diver, because you know they have the scene where one and Mignette are tied to the planks, uh-huh. where they have the birds eating the fish, and whoever, <laughs> which is such an interesting way to die. It's such a like. Um... Uh, like James, it's like James Bondy, right? And how the villains are like, I've set up. It's like the Austin Powers version, I guess. That's already spoofed it. Of like, we've set this whole Rube Goldberg machine up to kill you, and now we're just gonna walk out of the room, and we're just gonna assume it does. You know, it's, like, it's low tide James Bond. Yeah, it is. It's, that's exactly what it is. Just every, I mean, everything in this film is just crazy. Even it's wild. like the Jean Claude Dreyfus, who was Marcelo, the guy with the flies with the the, the poison the or whatever yeah. Yeah. oh yeah the flies that sting you but then you go bananas oh right i think that just that whole scene is probably my favorite where they're tied up on the planks and the, yeah he just appears on a boat oh, i'm here i got you <laughs> <laughs> and then Manette falls and it's a slow motion no <laughs> Like, what is happening thank god we had an old school diver here oh my gosh <laughs> yeah. that worked out great <laughs> this movie is just bananas it's wild it's a wild, it's a wild movie. <laughs> I, I mean, did you get anything interesting behind like the pre-production or like how? The only thing I really saw was it just it was made on the budget it was for eighteen million. Wasn't able to figure out like what that was in francs because I'm assuming this was made on a budget with francs. Um, there were a, a lot of sets, very large sets that were built to accommodate the production. Um, there was a. And there was a famed fashion designer who actually designed the costumes. Mm-hmm. Um, his name was uh, Jean-Paul Gaultier. Okay. Oh, yeah. But there's not a lot in terms of, like, behind-the-scenes notes. I think it's it may have been, like, a closed set or nobody was just really talking about it. Maybe this just flew under the radar for a lot of people. So, I mean. I think the set, I think I read about it, that the director, because it was so French, he's like, you know, in hindsight, when people review this film, they're like, wow, those sets were incredible. Do you have any memorabilia for it? But the director, when it was done, he was like, all right, you can just buy whatever you want. <laughs> Take it. We'll sell it. Whatever. We don't care. <laughs> and people nowadays are like, we know nothing about this movie. Sure. Can we do you have anything? He's like, no, I got rid of it all. It's so great. And like it's set, the sets. I feel like this movie is like all so much like set design. Right. And like production design and like the aesthetic elements it feels like and all of that stuff you're just like this is beautiful you know like the the plot the story whatever you know there's like you know the, there are things to discuss with that but in terms of just like some of the like they'll turn a corner and like the alley they go down i'm like this is the, the better than anything in terms of like the set itself that i've seen did like a movie this year <laughs> like it's so crazy i think the thinking behind that is as a director you want to get the last movie you made out of your head before mm-hmm. you move into another one. I mean, yeah. I get it. You don't want the design influ- the choices you made influencing your next movie. That makes sense. You just you want to move on. Like, it's the reason why Jurassic Park looks nothing like Schindler's List for Steven Spielberg. Mm-hmm. You just have to move on and just make those choices that are appropriate for that movie. Yeah, but- it's interesting how a lot of like directors and people who are like involved in the movies a lot of times like don't they're not as precious about that stuff as like we are mm-hmm. as like the viewer. Which is interesting. Like, oh, there are just a lot of jerks. Like, oh yeah, I didn't keep any of that. And you're like, oh, all right. No. It's interesting though that you yeah. say that, Chris, because his next movie was Aliens Resurrection, and mm-hmm. he's very steampunk, or not steampunk, as you said, that's punk. I think it's just very much in that same aesthetic. It looks very industrial. It looks mm-hmm. very grimy. But like this movie is kind of lauded as sort of like a landmark steampunk film, mm-hmm. and. For as long as I've been aware of the term, I've been trying to figure out what that means. Yeah. Like, it's, it's such a hard concept to figure out, like, what steampunk actually is. I always feel like it's, like, I mean, you know, and I, I don't, I know nothing. But, like, I feel like the fact that this movie has that, like, weird, like, it's it sort of feels like early turn of the century, but it's not really ever said. So it's, like, kind of fantastical. So there's, like technology elements that there is woven into this like old like industrial set like second industrial revolution like period Mm -hmm. is really like interesting i feel like a lot of steampunk stuff has that kind of you know we're gonna um morph these like this old this historical period with like newer like what if you put like all this new technology and gave it to like people in like 
1890 like what would that look like yeah. um yeah it's so it's so like i've never seen anything like it yeah you know like guillermo del toro does it we saw it with uh the wachowski sisters like in the matrix yeah so i know that was a big thing that i saw leading up to this film people were like oh well i feel like they got the idea of the matrix from this like the environment which oh interesting i didn't i don't agree with as much i feel like more guillermo del toro you know yeah. tim burton because it's just so it's so, i've never seen anything like it yeah. in my life right very, I I only see the I guess I will see the connection in terms of like it, it's very stylized mm-hmm. and like a way the Wachowski stuff is as well, but yeah that's an interesting con- comparison I didn't think about that me either yeah. <laughs> until I read it <laughs> if you didn't know that this was a French film this would almost look like it's something ripped out of the expressionistic mind of Tim Burton mm-hmm. yeah mm-hmm. it's almost comic book esque in a weird way just like how everything falls out and it's just so like you know tim burton dude. yeah everything kind of falls out it's very over the top yeah. it, it's it has an aesthetic and a design that's ripped straight out of a comic book mm-hmm. i mean everything like with that scene with mignette and then i think at the end right isn't there like when one and mignette is saved from the conjoined twins there's like something that gets hit by a dog yeah. and then it bounces well, from something oh the flea it I, bounces from i thought about that that feels like that is like the microcosm representation of like i feel like the director's whole thing in this movie it's like it can't just be one simple action it has to be like this ex- highly stylized like visual you know rube goldberg type thing um and it's like sort of like one of those scenes that sort of represents the movie as a whole like yeah we're making all these crazy choices everything's <laughs> sort of out there it's like that's the movie we're making um and i did the tim burton comparisons it, like really interesting like has that like sort of like german expressionism like woven in and like very you know there are no straight lines like it has that kind of like you know expressionistic like everything from the streets to the walls to the actors performances themselves mm-hmm. has that kind of bent to it and, and it's i have such a hard time explaining to people like what steampunk is and even trying to explain what like what tim burton's films are like is a challenge even mm-hmm. in of itself mm-hmm. but this is just like how do you explain you know a concept to somebody who might have no frame of reference for this oh yeah it's it's next to impossible it's hard like you can just desc- like it's a yes it's certainly a city by a dock right <laughs> but then there's also the retro looking you know police garb <laughs> and just the, the clothes that everybody's wearing then there's the the old school diving suit mm-hmm. and yeah. and yet there's somehow there's a brain in the box and blind people wear devices that make them see in the dark it almost like i feel like it's i guess like i thought of it as like sort of a steampunk fairy tale where especially i know we're gonna dig into it but like especially the treatment of like violence towards children is like very upsetting in a lot of scenes <laughs> but i feel like it's trying to harken back to that sort of like brothers grim fairy tales when you go back and read them and it's like oh there's this this stuff's really dark mm-hmm. and it feels like it has that like threat of real world violence woven into this like fantasy world i totally i i can see that because it's like all the characters are so dark yeah. Like even their color pattern, how they dress, the only ones that have some color to them and essentially is Mignette and one. Yeah. You know, and the little children. So it's very interesting, like the tone. Yeah. How they said it. Like try it's just such a weird like it's not a jolly movie, I wouldn't say. <laughs> yeah, I don't know if I call it jolly. It's not a jolly. Like <laughs> the choices this director makes from the opening scene of like Yeah. Santa Claus like freaking out this children and then like he has scenes where it's just like kids crying you know like there's so much in this movie <laughs> that is like more upsetting than like i just see like someone get hit by a truck or something like yeah. there's so much in this movie that is way more upsetting than like um you know movie you'll see that has like like explicit violence in it or something it's like the tone of it is like so upsetting and see like the santa claus thing is like there's nothing that feels drastically like you know you could show that to a child and it wouldn't be like oh my god what are you doing but like when you watch it you're like this is like 
very upset. It's nightmarish. I guess that's yeah. the word to use. It's like about these kids' nightmares, and the tone in lots of spaces is like nightmarish. The violence against that's perpetrated against the children is just it is disturbing on a whole other level. Yeah. And like before this, like the most disturbing scene I had watched involving children was probably the abduction and murder of a little boy in the film, Dr. Sleep. But this is just like the movie opens with a child's nightmare and presumably this child like dying and then being disposed of Mm -hmm. off of this oil platform or whatever in the middle of the ocean. Then there's children being kidnapped. At one point, uh, Mignette is being assaulted by one. Yeah. I mean, the the yeah. whole film is premised on you know Don Rie being abducted and just kind of shuttled along until he's going to get to you know Kronk and everyone else, presumably to die. Yeah, mm-hmm. like there were many moments while watching this where I just had to pause this and cleanse the palate with something else <laughs> uh-huh. i don't know how you guys felt watching this yes <laughs> yeah. yes yeah i mean because you're right it's it's not only the physical assault on the kids but it's also the mental them going into the yeah. psycho the psyche torturing their minds mm-hmm. you know going in there having nightmares yeah these poor children like i i was thinking when the film ended i'm like how are these kids ever going to go back to like normalcy like mignette right she goes into the like her nightmare like inception-esque yeah and then she switches with Kronk, where he becomes a baby and she's this old woman about to die and then has to go back to being a kid again i'm like wouldn't you be messed up you know <laughs> like back to reality i was thinking about it in terms of like i just thought about this in terms of like um there's i haven't seen it yet but there's a movie right now skinema rink mm-hmm. that is like I'm showing at the music box in Chicago right now, and it's like a nano budget movie. But I've read a few reviews that talk about like you watch it and it really gets you to that sense of like being terrified as a child for like no reason other than just like you're in a weird environment or like you're at home and the lights are off and you think everyone's left uh, the house. So you start freaking out. And I do kind of feel like a movie like this has that element of like you're watching it and it really gets you into that space of almost like childlike fear of like there's nothing you know well there are explicit you know threats but it's like it doesn't even have to be like that explicit that like violent for just be watching and being like oh i feel like i'm like seven years old and the lights are off and i'm like freaked out you know it has that kind of takes you back to that space it's like the the innocence that's being attacked in the film and yeah and and cronk apparently like the only Re, the only way that he can think of to stay alive in his current form is to do the most horrific thing imaginable, mm-hmm. which is disturbing in and of itself, even though his creator is presumably you know with him on yeah. this platform, this brain in the box. Mm-hmm. I think they, they refer to it as Uncle Irvin, I think. Yeah. Which is a very odd thing to call a brain in the box. <laughs> I um, don't know. This, I mean, between the two of them, this is the only way that they can think of to like keep Kronk alive. Mm-hmm. And to me, like, if you're going to create a, a robot that's just sophisticated, like, <laughs> isn't the robot like capable of analyzing morals and ethics? Just like, hey, do I really want to start kidnapping and killing children just so I can stay alive, even though I'm not technically a person? Right. It's a weird choice. It is. <laughs> like That's it's the robot so, you want to make. It's, it's such a weird <laughs> thought, especially for something that's so advanced as Kronk. Because like, yeah. he is a robot, right? I thought he was just a scientist. Well, he's like a, it, <laughs> is he? Uh, and I feel bad like if someone knows he is just as listening. But like, is he a robot or is he a clone? I thought he, he was a scientist and like he wanted to feel emotions. So he made clones. <laughs> <laughs> okay. well, the, I mean, so he, I mean, yeah, I mean, Kronk the, is a scientist. I got the impression that he was a robot. He had, because I remember he had the but dialogue. But he's artificial in some way. Like, he's either a robot or he was, like, created in the lab. I don't, I don't know. I thought, like, because he has the dialogue between the box, Uncle Irvin, and when Uncle Irvin is, like, pestering him about, like, not being able to sleep and he just wants to have good dreams instead of nightmares. So he, like, makes him cry the tear, mm-hmm. right? And then he hopes that with the tear, he'll be able to finally feel better. Yeah, but then the robot's like, "Nope, screw you! <laughs> it's all a lie because I hate you because you made me a brain in the box." <laughs> like I felt that was like his motivation. He just wants to like feel, and he's so miserable with his life. That's why he's torturing the children. Which is why I like this film because I felt like with him, 
I'm like, oh, that's got he's got a reason. He's a horrible person. Yeah. But. <laughs> Kronk <laughs> is very childlike in his mannerisms. Like he's yeah. aging yeah. prematurely and yeah. he's I mean I mean, often like children, I mean, oftentimes think very selfishly and they don't think things through. Like I mean and to Kronk thinking like, Oh, I'll just take children and take their dreams and that'll help me delay the aging process. Like yeah. I'm sure there's other ways, but like as a child you think of the first thing you often think of is just like, well, that's the thing I'm going to go with. Yeah, for sure. It's messed up. That's it, like some Tom Cruise feed is <laughs> being a, injected into my skin. There's a lot of. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Cruise. Hey, I want to make the most authentic movie ever made. So let's put everyone in $30 million jets. <laughs> it would be very funny if Cruise like had one of his crazy stunts, but it was in this movie. Like if he just like went off a cliff or something. But it's like, ah, eh, now he's there's a diver at the bottom. I don't or know. Just wait for the next Mission Impossible movie for him to like <laughs> right. break bones or something. It also it kind of had that like, um, is it Roald Dahl? Roald Dahl? Yeah. Um, like the Matilda writer and like, um, uh, shoot, Charlie and Chocolate Factory is that another? Like it sort of had that like, um, even the adults act like children mm-hmm. thing, and that I feel like is part of like maybe it's like fairy tale type thing where it's like. This is like this is a question. Is this a movie that for children or is this a movie that you watch as an adult and it is meant to bring you back to something like that's childlike? Like, do, can you show this to a kid? No. no. Oh, OK. I don't. I mean, it's a good thought. I just don't know if it's either of those. Right. Because, I mean, there's so much violence that's perpetrated against children. Yeah. And even with like a rolled doll novel. You have, yes, you have adults that behave like children. You have children, children. Mm -hmm. But then you also have the level-headed adults. And I feel like the only, like, even the level-headed adults in this movie are very, like, child-esque. Yeah. One Mm -hmm. especially. But then you look at, you know, the octopus. And you also look at the diver and the clones and (laughs) Marcello and Martha. And they're all just, yeah, they're all, they're all serving Kronk and his nefarious wishes mm-hmm. so even there are no level-headed adults here there's just children no. and the the evil bastards who are trying to get at them right and you were saying like and i think this is true you were saying like mignette is kind of like sort of like the only audience surrogate in a certain way it's like she's really like the only or the most i guess like level-headed character yeah. as a child because one like when dunri gets away one just like sits on the stairs and he starts banging Freaking against the out. house and right there yes like, will you shut up or whatever i loved that i could have watched the whole movie of just perlman just bashing set <laughs> with his bare hands yes Are you kidding me love that scene <laughs> but it's mignette that's like okay cool so are we gonna keep going yeah <laughs> so she really is the only like in a weird way level-headed person yeah i guess like you and like like i agree you probably shouldn't show this to a child but it has that like child child book story thing of like an adult who acts like a child and the children around that adult um, like a child around that adult the protagonist like has to like help that uh character who is older than them like learn a lesson or Mm -hmm. something uh sort of had like that kind of thing to it as well Mm mm-hmm what did you think of like the side villain as the conjoined twins? That's an interesting choice. I would almost <laughs> preferred if the octopus was the main villain of this movie rather than the brain in the box. Yeah. 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 But, Cause she's, she's very menacing. She's very calculated, very manipulative. Mm-hmm. And I don't know. I th- I, the idea of, of somebody who's that manipulative and controlling is just, it's always so scary to me because you think of like cult leaders and mm-hmm. people like Charles Manson, for instance, who man- are able to manipulate people to doing their will and doing evil things on people. Oh, and the yeah. octopus was probably more scarier to me than the brain in the box. It's sort of like it's an interesting character, too, in terms of like, obviously, it's not really set in any particular. It's not set in like a historical place. Right. So this is like a fantasy world. But it's very clear, like this is dystopian in a way that like the society itself is like sort of in ruins like it's not the government system is not really clear everything's Mm -hmm. just kind of like a mess and like institutionally there are like the institutions have clearly broken down in this world so it was interesting in that like cult like figure way where you have this character or characters that are like um what happens and how do how do people like this manipulate and take um 
uh, advantage of areas in, in worlds where there are not institutions uh, in place and or like institutions have fallen apart mm-hmm. and you get people who like filled the void like that. Mm-hmm. And she did. Yeah. I know the their the director wanted her to be able to walk like the twins, but they couldn't design like a boot that worked. So that's why they're just like standing most of their scenes and they don't right. have any of them like walking. Cause it's, right. yeah, I mean, it wasn't, the octopus wasn't, it was two different actors. Like they weren't actually conjoined as people. I, it's such a, like, um, the actual physical acting they do with it is like really impressive. Yeah. It's crazy. Mm-hmm. With all the hands. Yeah, like, like the, the how the hands, like, you know, intermesh and stuff like that. That uh, was really interesting. Well, so. And the rehearsal, too, of the way they're able to kind of interchange their dialogue together so it's very mm-hmm. seamless. Yeah. It's very, I mean, it's uh, Genevieve Bonet and uh, Odile Mallet as the octopus, and they're a, a credit to how much work that they poured into yeah. portraying this character. Right, right. Absolutely. Everyone in this film did a great job. <laughs> they, like they really did. With very bizarre material. Very. Everybody was like, this isn't a movie where you're watching it and you're like, half the cast is not on board. It's not like one of those where it's like, I don't know, like a House of Gucci where you're like, oh, Jeremy Irons doesn't want to be here. You know, it's like, <laughs> it's not like one of those. It's like everyone who is in this is like, I get what movie this is. I want to be in this type of movie and I'm going to try to like knock it out of the park. Oh, kind yeah. Of thing. Even like, I, I found the church. I call it the church scene where the guys like, mm. I guess, get an eyeball, the lens thing oh, yeah. put in. I found that scene to be so unique. Like yeah. Just how they set it up, how close everyone was sitting to each other and like how vertical it was. Yeah. I like bring in the kids. You told me you were only going to bring in more, but you brought less. <laughs> this nothing in this movie really followed like uh, where I thought it was going to follow. No. And that was kind of fascinating. It wasn't, it's it's not, a, we'll get to the, like the ranking stuff later. It's not a thing where I was like, I love every single choice this movie made. But it, it's always interesting to see a movie where you're like, I didn't know they were going to do that. So, mm-hmm. like, I couldn't predict anything that happened. No. Yeah. Not at all. It's wild. It was, it just, it was mind blowing. <laughs> <laughs> What'd you guys think of the ending? The ending was. No, I would be lying if I said I understood the ending. <laughs> um, I mean, I, I mean, they figure out. I mean, the, where the children are being kept, and they go to this abandoned oil platform, and you know, Miet is able to trick everybody into you know just destroying themselves, and you know, somebody's harpoon through the chest, and it's just it's a very it's a more violent ending than what I was expecting for this movie. Yeah. Especially the fact that the entire platform is just blown to smithereens. Yeah. In the most comical, you know, three stooges esque way of a, of a seagull landing on a dynamite plunger. Yeah. Do we think the ending of X-Men two is based off this ending? <laughs> Where they save all those kids from the Hoover Dam or whatever. <laughs> I just realized that. Oh, uh, like, I don't, I don't know if that's the case. Like, We're really going after that kind of vibe, you know? Yes. And they're like pitching it. Um, uh, but no, yeah, I, I, I guess like I can only think about the ending in terms of thinking about it as like a trying to create like a new fairy tale. Like in that, like you know, it's violent. It's you know, there are upsetting parts to it. Um dude gets blown up that's and stuff like that but like trying to create that kind of like fairy tale scent that's like dark and still i don't know if this is literally like a movie with like a lesson but it has like a like um mythical streak to it i guess oh yeah yeah it's like it's just so perplexing because it ends with just like one of those old school like where it has the hole yeah. Over uh, the person then. The Looney goes, Tunes thing. The Looney Tunes yeah. thing on Doon Ri. Right. Who the whole film seemed like he didn't care whether he <laughs> was taken or anything. He just wanted food well, the Dune, whole time. Doon Ri might be the all-star of this movie. <laughs> I swear. I think so. He literally ate a candle. Because it looked he, like a He's sauce. sort of invincible because he's never like afraid. He's just like, I just want to eat. And how, rel- how relatable is that? So relatable. <laughs> being like, I don't <laughs> really care. I just want to eat. 
<laughs> well, more to your point, Matt, like, isn't that like kind of the idea of mythology and fairy tales is you can pick out like what you want from it. Yeah. Like, so, I mean, yeah, I can kind of see where Junet is going in terms of like, not exactly making this a science fiction film, but maybe making this like a sci-fi, like a sci fantasy film. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And like, you can draw whatever you want from it. I don't know if there is one overarching theme to it or one singular lesson to pull from it, but I mean, ultimately like, you know, in all of our folklore, I mean, ultimately, you know, good prevails over evil. Mm-hmm. And it's very, this very much kind of fits into that, you know, the, the, you know, Joseph Campbell's hero of a thousand faces or, you know, the hero's journey, like this very much fits into that archetype. Yeah, it does have like as weird and bizarre as it is. And like, as like strange choices that are made, it does fit into, like you said, like that formula, uh, which is fascinating. Fascinating, and yet also at the same time embracing science fiction tropes. Yes, mm-hmm. you know, the the probably the oldest science fiction trope is the idea of a creator hating his creation. Right. Oh yeah. We're, yeah, we were talking about that, with like the like the Frankenstein thing. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, which is like very much takes lots of components of, uh, and places in the plot. Um, yeah. It's just such a bizarre film. It's Honestly, very much a grab bag of things. I don't think we've ever seen anything like this no, before. Because the tone. Grab, wa- grab bag is a good way to put it. There's like so many different types of things that are oh, tried yeah. and put in the movie. I don't necessarily. I feel like I tried to read a couple of reviews after I watched it. And I feel like a lot of the reviews are kind of like obviously very, um, you know, laud the production design, laud the, sh- the style of the shots and performances and stuff. And but I have but a lot of them were sort of mixed about like the plot and were sort of like they're trying a lot of stuff mm-hmm. you know I, I feel like I read a few reviews that were like it's just trying a lot it doesn't always like work as like you know it doesn't always like function normally but it it it's like one of those movies where they're just kind of throwing a lot of stuff at the wall and you know there's bad there's merit in that yeah oh yeah it's not something I've ever seen in my life mm-hmm. like you have scenes where Crank is trying to fall asleep and they're telling him stories the little clones <laughs> like one after the other trying to sneak by uh-huh. you know you get that but then you get also like the octopus trying to murder her, like mignette this sh- this surely is like it must have just been like an actor's like paradise because i feel like no idea was like a bad idea no. everybody gets to try like whatever <laughs> they want you know, especially like the actor who played the clones, like he's doing so much. Everyone's doing so much physicality, but I feel like that actor especially is doing so much like interesting physicality choices. And like, again, it's like very like black box theater like style oh, of yeah. stuff. What do you guys think of the CGI or like the graphics for the time? Like what, 1995? 95. This is two years after Jurassic Park. <laughs> I mean, it's very rudimentary. I don't think I would have relied on it so much, mm-hmm. especially for you know the Rube Goldberg s death of the octopus. <laughs> um, it's just very like ninety CGI is just not great during mm-hmm. this time. I mean, we've seen enough movies during this time period to know that, like, with very few notable exceptions, one being Jurassic Park, mm-hmm. like the CGI does not look great. Oh, you didn't Whenever, like, like the aging process? Not really. Like when, yeah. min- oh, I, I, I mean, it's great. I mean, really, that's <laughs> kind of, it's like, that's not that hard to do, I don't think, because you, you generally are going to try and find older actor, actresses that kind of look similar and then use a way of like blending their faces together. Dissolving it. Yeah, yeah. It's just like, it's age progression is what mm-hmm. it is. Like that, I don't, I don't see that as any sort of like grand innovation for the time. Fair. Yeah, mm-hmm. it's tough because it's like you – and I think there are movies today that are going to suffer from this, and, you know, even a couple of years, but like 5, 10, 15 years down the line, right, where we think something now, like, oh, this is like the height of CGI, and then in like 15 years it'll be like, that looks terrible. Mm-hmm. So it's tough. I feel like the movies in the 90s especially that do well with CGI are the ones that use like CGI to like cover up the seams of something, but not really like relying on it so hard like you're saying. Yeah, CGI for when this came out was designed to enhance your movie, not to yeah. cover up mistakes or not substitute for any sort of filmmaking or production design or anything like that. That's not what CGI was, in my mind, is meant to do. Right. And then, of course, you have people like James Cameron who are just like, everything <laughs> CGI all the time. <laughs> <laughs> well, and uh, it's just, it is strange because, like, the the practical stuff in this movie is so good. Like, you know, like just the, 
whether it's practical effects or like just going back to the production design so that's very um jarring when they mix like really good like just like old school movie magic with like very rudimentary cgi from the time yeah 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 yeah, like the insect stuff yeah yeah Yeah. very interesting yeah the insect was jarring for me yeah like a, you're like what the hell? I mean, maybe do <laughs> like this PlayStation. Maybe do like a Who Framed Roger Rabbit thing where you have animation that would I think that would have like kind of played into the whole steampunk cartoonish aesthetic of this. Yeah, it kind of helped take away some of the tension from the fact like oh by the way children are being abducted. Right, a little more like a <laughs> style. The movie's already stylized, so it's like maybe even making it more stylized. Steer into the skid. Yes, you're just kidding. If you're gonna make it, if you're gonna stylize it, stylize the hell out of it. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, that could have been helpful. Yeah, have the insects be like steampunk. Oops. Wear little top hats, but Wait, also have like you know goggles? a revolver or something. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. I'm not. I don't want to insult the now steampunk. Now we're re- crowd. now we're just going off the cliff. <laughs> yeah, after searing into the skid. <laughs> so wait, what then was your lens flare? Oh, oh, um. I mentioned it with the dramatic Rube Goldberg S series of events that leads to <laughs> the ship crashing into the docks and the octopus being, you know, f- you know finally, mercifully for our sake, being you know, killed. Yeah. <laughs> that was mine. It was like, okay, like, come on. It's so, over, I mean, it is so, like, purposefully over the top oh, to, like. It's like watching a Garfield comic strip. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> But uh, yeah, that, yeah, I feel like that like that must just be the director's like hold. I feel like that sequence. I could be wrong, but I feel like that must that sequence feels like if there are like a if there's like one scene in each movie, or uh, you know sometimes that like is like this is my thesis for this whole movie. That sequence feels like that where the director's like, we don't have to do all this, but I'm gonna do all this. Like <laughs> <laughs> that's just, that's like the whole movie, you know? Yes. What was was that your lens flare? Can you define for me the lens flare oh, thing? Oh, sure. A lens flare is – so you know J.J. Abrams' Star Trek? Yeah. Where the lens flare is on the ship, and you're like, what right. the hell is this? Right. Like, so, yeah, it's something that's like jarring, takes you out of the movie, and you're like, what? Like, um, why does this have to be in there? Let me think. Um, you go first. I'll think of I'll think of it while you're talking. Sure, sure. My lens flare, I think, was initially the opening scene. With yeah. like the Santas, I was like, "What the hell am I watching?" Right. <laughs> Initially, the first time I watched it, yeah. but later on, uh, as it moved, it was actually the same. Like the sequence leading to like the death of the octopus, because I'm like, all these things are just happening, right. and the movie just seemed not grounded at all. Yeah. But it did. I just didn't think that it would go from like this flea jumping from thing to sure. thing to thing to thing to thing sure. to lead to the demise. I guess my 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 mine might be that scene like right after the beginning scene where they're just yelling. Or do you remember that part? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. They all are just screaming and it's like super, super wide fishbowl style wide angle lenses on their faces just yelling. Yeah. And I truly was like, Okay, I guess this is what we're watching. You know. <laughs> It's going to be one of these movies. Good God. <laughs> it's just, I don't know what the hell is happening. That was, yeah, probably that one. Yeah. Were there any uh, red shirts? So a red shirt, so like in Star Trek, uh-huh. uh, in the original series, a red shirt, anyone wearing a red shirt would always just die. Oh, sure. Obviously, always just be killed off. Right. So we have a red shirt is someone that dies. A lot of time it's animals because yeah, like, yeah. people like it in movies are like, oh, let's just murder this cow. Sure. Show that we're bad. Sure. So that's our red shirt or yellow shirt as Chris has them as uh, someone that's kind of like good. an unsung hero. <laughs> oh, okay, yeah. So, uh, I mean, I had a red shirt, but for me, it was the the carnival manager who's stabbed by the hobo at the beginning of the movie and leaving one all alone. I mean, and you can tell that one heavily relied on this person to get through his life every day. Yeah, and yet it's like it's just he's just murdered in the middle of the street. Nobody does anything. <laughs> That whole circus culture thing on this movie, <laughs> I was saying it up, but like, you can really, it's like you can only have two jobs in this world. You can either uh, work at the circus or you can kidnap children. It's like <laughs> those two. And if you don't fit into that, you have to like move to a different city. Like, that's, you know, the LinkedIn for them is just, you know, <laughs> kidnapping kids or circus. Uh, yeah. I'll agree. That was my red shirt too. 
<laughs> yeah. But a, yeah, that was crazy. It was good. That was wild. Right. Do you want to know? So there is toxic fandom for this film. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah, on uh, IMDb. So it's incorrectly regarded as a goof. So that's what I see. When stealing the safe, Nyet and the other thieves use an unnecessarily complicated method to retrieve the apartment key. As the magnet easily fit underneath the door, they could have attained the key by attaching the magnet to a stick or a piece of string and retrieve it themselves. Thus, obviating the use of the cheese, the mouse, and the cat. This is, in fact, the joke of the scene and was used intentionally for the sake of the original and the entertainment value. So they point it out as a goof, and yet they figure out why it's in the movie in the first place. (laughs) So it's not really good. Yeah, that's one of those things, right, where I feel like if you read that to the director, you'd be like, shut up. I would (laughs) have... I want to make fun of this comment, but at the same time, it's probably the most self-aware comment that exists on the internet. Sure. <laughs> like, I understand I'm being a jerk. <laughs> it's like, if you know what you're doing, then don't be a pedant, all right? <laughs> it's so dumb. Like, this is not something to be a pedant about. Who cares? Mm-hmm. Like, if you understand the fact that it is entertainment value, you could have just kept this opinion to yourself. Well, I, oh, I wrote this down. Uh, I was like, you can't, this is not a movie you could do like a cinema sense for. Like there's, you can't watch this movie and be like, why did they do that? It's like this whole movie is stylistic, ex- expressionistic, fairy tale. Like it's not supposed to be like, you know, oh, they can all just open the door. <laughs> it's like, well, that's not what the movie is. It doesn't so, make sense. It's, well, it's literally like the, thing of saying like you know, why are they breaking out into song and it's like well it's a musical i don't know what to tell you it's a, yeah it happens <laughs> it does. Right? it's just the movie like, man. just watch west side story and forget why i need to sing america all right, right. just enjoy the thing <laughs> just enjoy the movie uh in terms of legacy for this movie i know that they actually made a game so they made a video I game. Heard the, I read this, <laughs> yeah. which is bananas to me. It is bananas. Did you go like watch any of like game I, footage? I did. Okay, but it's so, like, like an hour long game, and you just your minute, and you just wander around doing cool. like little chores for people to get to the next place, and you have to like talk. It's like RPG. Okay. Yeah, but there's like no violence. It's just being like, oh well, if you want me to help you unlock this door, you have to do this for me. And then you get it, and then they're like, "All right, here you go." Like even at the end of the game, that's so weird. You get to like the <laughs> oil rig, and then she just stumbles upon the brain, and he's like, "You have to help us, but you have to save the children." And then literally, it's like a minute, and she just wanders around, opens the door, and it's like, "Hooray! You <laughs> save the children!" <laughs> it's truly like one of those joke things where someone's like yeah they should make like a forza gump video game but like they actually just went and did it they're like all right yeah here's your you just game. run the whole time <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's actually like a track and field game i'd play that game that's great <laughs> yeah. you I just run across like if it's just a running simulator but you get to go everywhere in the country right it'd be a great game it becomes like a first person shooter during like the nom one of series and then it just becomes like running the rest of the game i just felt like running <laughs> Jenny, I'm running. <laughs> this, that was horrible. Sean edited that, that out. <laughs> that was great. It, but I highly recommend it. If you want to like okay. be bored while watching a video game. That's like a game like your grandma accidentally gets you. Some like kid in like 1996 like act like wanted like crash bandicoot and his grandma was like they didn't have it but i got you the city of lost children <laughs> and then you have to just play that it's like your one game you got that year yep. i will say though <laughs> even the game for 96 they What's still it? embody the steampunk and it actually looks pretty good mm-hmm. and like the overhead okay. let's say my critiques of it was the overhead shots like it would be an over unnecessary overhead shot sure. and you could barely see the character i'm like yeah a lot. I feel like a lot of those like PlayStation or Dreamcast games had that issue of like, where do you want the camera? You know, like it was just yeah, a lot of that. Yeah, it's not until the PlayStation Two where they really figure out it's either first person or like directly behind or over yeah. the shoulder. Like <laughs> they haven't like figured the language out of that yet. Not no. yet. But what a great uh, one to try things out with. <laughs> the City of Lost Children. Yes. Oh, in terms of uh, ratings, those oh, yeah. Rotten Tomatoes it holds an eighty percent. Okay. Off of 59 uh, reviews with an average of a 7.4 out of 10. Uh, it's got a 73 on Metacritic. And then Roger Ebert gave it a 3 out of 4 stars, writing that the film's design and visual effects deserve the highest possible praise 
but the story was sometimes confusing. I'd be lying if I understood the plot. <laughs> that I feel like that's one of the more honest things he's ever said. Yeah, that's like a pretty on the note uh, or like spot on Ebert review, I think. I think I read that one and I agreed with like almost all of it, I think. It was hard for us to describe the plot just yeah. in the synopsis. Yeah. Like I, I I had to distill it down to the most basic, like inciting incident of this thing. Right. <laughs> that's without getting into the you know, the, the clones and the brain in the box and the blind <laughs> cults. It's it's but a joint twin that's well, just manipulating children and the thieves. Right. Yeah, city of lost children. <laughs> it made uh, eleven million off of eighteen million, so it didn't uh, make back its budget. It did not even get a release in North America for a long time. Like it got a very limited release, but even then, that it only made like less than two million dollars in North America. That's crazy. I don't even think this got a release in the United States. Like, no. like, I, could, like I think it was just Canada or like, yeah, in, in the United States and Canada. But like I, this was probably in some like local art house theaters that you right. can like one of your black box theaters that you're talking about, right, Matt. Right, right. Well, you had mentioned, and I do wonder if like part of the legacy of this movie is just that being this like introduction of Ron Perlman <laughs> to a lot of. Um, not just international audiences, but like specifically the auteur directors who are immediately like, I must work with this, you know, uh, this man like Del Toro. <laughs> it's got to be like that's the only like big takeaway I've got from this is like Ron. This is a feather and a cat for Ron Perlman yeah. mm-hmm. that would then you know percolate nine years later in when Hellboy released. Uh huh. It has to. It makes yeah. That makes sense. I mean, some it's people a calling card. Good calling card. You know, for Ron Perlman. I made the city of lost children. <laughs> <laughs> I was the only American in a French movie. <laughs> and I didn't even need to know French. You know, some people actually interpreted this film as a dual nature of capitalism, as it uh, constitutes as a source of tension in the film. I don't know if that's true. They that, say, <laughs> well, that does, that feels like one of those where they're like, what's your movie about? And the director's like, oh, capitalism. <laughs> like, okay. It's like one of those weird stats that you see on like, you know, NFL pages. They're like, oh, it's the first matchup between two quarterbacks who are six, seven. Like, yeah. wow, you're digging deep for this one, aren't you? <laughs> it, it has to be because it's like. It's like maybe it's about capitalism. Right. Yeah. That's such a generic answer, I too. Know. I don't know. They're like in the sense that I guess any movie's about capitalism. Every movie is about the pursuit of capitalism because they want to make money. That's such a basic answer, and I feel funny. (laughs) It's pretty fantastic. It's so it's so reductive, and it's so just oh my god! It's It's about family. Okay. (laughs) I love. Okay, again, like you can make the argument that every movie is about family, so. Are like you... I don't really think capitalism as a theme is a very strong one, considering that like Europe is <laughs> Europe is Europe. Mm-hmm. Like it is a free society, and yeah, sure, capitalism exists. It's just not as pervasive over there as it is here. Are you saying that the director doesn't know what his movie's about? I think he knows exactly <laughs> what movie he made. He made a, a, he made a sci-fi or not even sci-fi. He made a science fantasy movie. With the steampunk aesthetic. He knew exactly what he was making. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Yeah. Uh, it feels like it's his try up because he made like one movie before this, right? Um, it feels like a, like when directors talk about like, well, I didn't know if I was going to make another movie. So I wanted to try everything out just in case, you know, it, I don't know if that was his mentality going into it, but it sort of feels like an audition movie yeah. where he's like, I want to show you all the stuff I can do, <laughs> even if the story doesn't quite check out and then i'll make the movie i actually want yeah <laughs> which is alien resurrection right. yeah. <laughs> what i've always wanted to do is bring ripley back I mean, come on yeah 100%. i mean considering the original idea for that movie was to not have ripley in it at all that's a very smart idea that was a good choice nah, that's a good choice if you can have sigourney put her in is a pretty logical like that's that's a good movie rule you can't make an alien movie without sigourney weaver but right that's a that's a podcast we've already had. Yes, <laughs> we have. And if you'd like to see that, revisit our suite. <laughs> so, Matt, yeah. uh, with all this in mind, anything else? Well, before we go to our rating. um, I don't think so. You guys are all. Oh, you know what? The City reminded me of Babe 2. Did you guys Have you guys seen Babe 2, Pig in the no, City? No. I haven't I'm... seen the first one. You wait, don't have to see the wait, first one. The Pig movie? Yeah. Babe 2, Pig in the City. It's directed by George Miller. <laughs> Of Mad Max fame. <laughs> Babe 2 Pig in the City may be a masterpiece. It's so 
good. It's like a surrealist nightmare. Like this movie. It's, it has a very similar bent as this movie. You don't have to see the first Babe. Just go watch. Just read the synopsis of Babe 1. You barely even need to do that. Go watch Babe 2, Pick in the City. It has that like, what kind of city is this? And it's like, I don't know. It's the city. It has like <laughs> that kind of thing. Anyway. John and I are just looking at each other like WTF. Check it out. I, babe, I'm you're, you. you're promoting a movie about Babe 2. I'm too. telling you, you should go see Babe 2 Pig in the City. <laughs> all right, all right. We'll, get right on that. Okay. <laughs> Maybe we'll review it on this podcast. Sure. Sure. We'll get right on it when I'm not watching The Last of Us on HBO. <laughs> Could be a good, yeah, intermission. It's just Babe 2. Um, that's all I have. <laughs> Right. Let's get into our final rating for the city of lost children. So using our unique scale for the force fed sci-fi podcast of wouldn't watch, would watch, would own, it would host a viewing party. Start with our guests, Mr. Matt Hooper. What do you give to the city of lost children? I would give it exactly what I did, which is I would watch. Um, I don't know if I would own this movie. Um, I would not like be upset about owning this movie, um, but it is, I think a one and done for me. I watch it, you know, very interesting. Lot, there are a lot of elements I liked. It didn't all kind of fit together for me. It's sort of like one of it feels like one of those meals you have at like a restaurant where you're like, "Yeah, this is good. I don't think I'll come back, but <laughs> I'm ha- I, I had a good time. I had a nice conversation, and uh, I we tried it, and you have to try it, you know. And I think it's this is like one of those for me. So I would watch it. <laughs> Okay, thanks, man. Of course. Chris, how about you? <laughs> um, you know, I don't know if the steampunk aesthetic was the right choice for this movie. I think there's too many things that this kind of latches onto to make it digestible. I, I, I mean, I can appreciate what um, Jean-Pierre Jeunet was trying to do in making this, you know, science fantasy movie. But this just, this checks too many boxes, and it's all over the place for me. And granted, like, the, the combination of the unsettling imagery and the violence against children and just this meandering confusing story it doesn't make for a great film <laughs> however it's still watchable mm-hmm. like you're you're you go along and you're very interested in terms of what happens because it is it goes in very unexpected directions so i will say for that reason this is still a would watch for me all right what about you sean oh man this movie <laughs> you've got thoughts i do you know part of me really wants to put this as would host a viewing party <laughs> just because i love how bananas it is yeah it's literally just insane yeah like it's got everything you could think of or even want like ah you want to see violence against children <laughs> wham we got that in there yeah, it wants a strong word but yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> i feel got... like a butt's coming on with this review though well <laughs> they've got it's just it you know my expectations were just like blown out of the water but mm. i wouldn't say uh it's it's at that level so i'll put this as a wood own nice because i i love the ambiance the environment i love the kooky nature of it and just how bananas this thing was i probably will watch it again to be honest with you wow i started watching it with my partner and she looked at me and said sean what am i watching (laughs) (laughs) and when a fair assessment that is a fair assessment that is the reason i don't watch most of these movies with my wife (laughs) (laughs) because i try to avoid that question (laughs) Whenever I hear that question, I know I'm in the right ballpark. So for that, this is like right there. It's like right in between. I could take it 50-50s, host a viewing party or would own. So sure. that's where I'm at, and I'm happy for that. You and all your clones. Like a party for you and all your clones, and they're like lab coats. Yes. Um, you can all watch together. That's right. After we've uh, gone in the murky waters pulling <laughs> up. Random nonsense. I wanted to say I like that they keep the, they they bring the brain in the box with them. Yeah, uh, the kids at the end. I I really I th- I literally thought like oh that's nice. Yeah. These kids are just bringing the brain in the box with them because he didn't do anything. No, so it's like that's kind of sweet. I don't know. <laughs> this movie is just crazy. Yeah, it's cool. great, great banana. <laughs> well, with that gentleman, I'm very grateful to have you on this podcast for Foreign Sci-Fi Month. Matt, hey, it's a thank, pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. This is a lot of fun. Thank good. you, guys. No problem, Chris. As always, it's always a pleasure, my good sir. Likewise, Sean. And thank you, folks, for listening. Uh, if you enjoyed this podcast and would like to check out some more, go to forcefedsci-fi.com. We're on 
pretty much any services that you get your music, your podcasting from Spotify, Apple Podcasts, wherever else you get yours. If you would like us to review a movie, send us an email and we'll check it out. For us and the Force Fit Sci-Fi team, we'll see you next time. Bye!